All right. So I'll get started now. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for an introduction to Inuit culture. Uh, my name in my language is Arla, um, and in English that means stranger. Um, now, not every Inuktitut name means something in English. Um, I just took on a nickname that was given to me and translated it into Inuktitut, and now it is my legal single name. Um, thanks to the province of Ontario, they've made it free until January of 2022 for Indigenous peoples to change their name. Um, if they are a residential school survivor, if they're a direct descendant of a residential school survivor, or if their culture had a history of single name use only. Um, and Inuit, since time immemorial, only used single names. So I was able to legally change my name to just a first name. So Arla is my name. I'm an Inuk. So Inuit in English means people. And since there's only one of me, I am an Inuk. I'm a person. And now in my language, we have single, double, and multiple. So one, two, and many. So we have one Inuk, two Inuk, and three or more Inuit. Um, and Inuit in Canada, I come from a, a province in Canada called Labrador. Um, Inuit in Canada live all across the Arctic. So we come from Labrador, we come from northern Quebec, we come from Nunavut, which uh, Canada gave to us in the year 1999. And we also come from the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. Now, we also live in Alaska, which is part of the United States. We live in Siberia, which is part of Russia. And we also live in Greenland, which is part of Denmark. So Inuit like to live up north in the circumpolar region or the the arctic um, we enjoy the cold we've survived in the cold for tens of thousands of years um, and a long time ago inuit were nomads so we didn't live in permanent locations we didn't live in permanent structures we traveled where the best hunting was so if it was a season for caribou hunting, then we would bring our communities inland along the caribou migration trails. Um, if it was good seal hunting time, then we would bring our communities next to the ocean so we could hunt the seal out on the ice. And if you see here behind me, um, resting on my chair, this is actually a seal skin um, that I have at home. This is a ring seal. Um, and so, yeah, we lived in igloos, which were houses built out of snow. Um, when there was no snow around, we had tents that were made from animal parts. Um, and we also built sod houses. So sod houses were built using the land around you, the rocks. Um, we used whale bones as our roof trusses, and we used sod to cover the roof. Hence the name sod houses. Um, and so they were basically like man-made caves that were out on the land. Um, and before cell phones, um, Inuit communicated with a structure that's called um, an Inukshuk. So an Inukshuk does not have to look like a person. Um, an Inukshuk is a pile of rocks that tells a story. So if you happen upon an Inukshuk and one arm is longer than the other, then you go towards the long um, arm. That's the direction you need to head in. Inukshuks also told people where there was good hunting. So an Inukshuk would be built from shore. And then if you measured the distance from shore to the, from the Inukshuk to the shore, put your kayak in the water and went out the same distance, then that's a good fishing spot. Um, sometimes they were built with holes in them. And if you put your head in the hole, then off in the distance, you would see 
um, the next thing that it was trying to point out to you. It cut out all of that peripheral vision uh, because up in the Arctic, there are no trees. Um, and like traditionally a long time ago, there was snow on the ground like 10 months out of the year. So everything was covered, everything looked the same. So how did we distinguish things? Well, we built Inukshuks. If you ever get a chance to travel up north and you happen upon an Inukshuk, do not change it. Some of these Inuksuit have been standing for hundreds of years and people have been following them. Um, and if you change them, now you may get somebody lost. Um, up in the Arctic, right, which is not a good thing. Um, and we had, in the past, we had, like, gender roles. So girls were taught how to sew and how to take care of younger kids. Um, they also helped raise the puppies, which would then turn into the, the sled dogs. Um, boys were taught how to hunt. Um, and, and so we had gender roles back then, uh, but they weren't always so cut and dry because Inuit have like this naming practice. Um, for instance, I have a, I have a daughter. Um, she's 16 years old and uh, she's named after my dad. So my dad passed in the year 2000 and his name was Sam. And my daughter was born in the year 2004 and I named her Sam after my dad. So being named after a boy when my daughter was younger, she would have been taught the same things that a boy would have been taught until the age of puberty. And then after puberty, she would start learning everything that a woman was supposed to learn. Um, and now because my daughter is named after my dad, um, Inuit believe in reincarnation so, and your soul is attached to your name. So I have to treat my daughter with the same respect and dignity that I would have given to my dad um, in his previous lifetime. Um, it's a really nice way to remember somebody that you love. It's, uh, sorry, my dog's going a little crazy right now. I'm gonna try and quiet him down. Uh, but it's a way to remember somebody that you loved. Um, it's a way to fix relationships. Um, due to residential schools, my dad and I, we didn't really have a, a good relationship um, when he was alive in his previous lifetime. Now my daughter and I were really close, we're really tight knit. Uh, my dad also wasn't always so proud of his culture because of residential schools. He was taught that it was an inferior culture. Um, and now my daughter is a professional throat singer. Uh, she's throat sang for Justin Trudeau at both of his swearing-in ceremonies. Um, she's been to the Calgary Stampede. She was uh, the headliner of the American Folk Festival in Bangor, Maine, um, and all of this before she was even 16. And she's super-duper proud of her culture. Um, in high school now, she's part of like a Native Studies class, um, and she's always chiming in and teaching the teacher and teaching the other students. Um, and it's, it's very nice to see. Um, Inuit have gone from igloos to iPods in one generation. So technology, uh, we had to learn it really, really fast. Um, in fact, there are Inuit who are alive today who lived a nomadic lifestyle. My children's uh, grandmother was actually born on the land and raised on the land. Um, and now you can find her on Facebook. She has her own Facebook account. Um, so it happened really, really fast, really transition. Um, so today, how do Inuit live up north? Well, we live in houses um, just like down here except most of our houses up north don't have basements because of the permafrost. Um, we, most houses in the smaller communities don't even have second floors. So they're just bungalows that are built above ground. Uh, most of our communities are really small in size. The largest Inuit city in, in Canada is Iqaluit. There's about 10,000 people who live there. They have an airport. They have paved roads. Um, so it's a little bit different than most other Inuit communities. And in Canada, 
We have 53 different Inuit communities. Um, they're all fly in only. So the only way to get there is by plane or in the summertime, you can take a boat. Um, and only one of them is inland. And that's Baker Lake. All the rest of them are built next to the coast. Um, another neat, interesting fact about Baker Lake Nunavut is it is the geographical center of Canada. It is the middle of Canada. So I like to joke and say when you're in Baker Lake, you're not in the middle of nowhere. Um, you're actually in the middle of Canada, which is kind, kind of neat. People don't realize how big and vast Canada is, but the center of Canada is in Nunavut. I think that's pretty cool. And because all of our communities are fly-in only, um, that means all of our food has to fly or take the, the boat, the shipping boat, in the summertime. So food gets really, really expensive. Um, here in Ottawa, if my kids wanted a watermelon, I could go down to the grocery store and I, like five bucks in my pocket, I'm coming home with a watermelon. In Greece Fjord, Nunavut, which is the furthest community north, um, one single watermelon costs $68. So they don't tend to sell them as one big whole watermelon. What they do is they cut them in half and then they cut them in half again. So you end up with four quarters of a watermelon and each quarter sells for $17. Um, in Baker Lake, where my children have family, because that's where their mom is from, uh, not in Arctic Bay, sorry, where my children have family, um, one can of frozen juice is $11.29 for something that we get here in Ottawa for a dollar. Um, in Clyde River, a uh, single green pepper is $10.29, and a, a red pepper is $16.29. Um, so Inuit today, we still hunt fish and trap um, just to supplement our diet. I mean, we can't go to the grocery store all the time, all year round, um, and still expect to, to live just the food prices are so, so high. So today we still hunt seal. Um, we eat seal. We eat polar bear, muskox, caribou, ptarmigan is a bird, ducks, geese. Um, if it moves up north, we probably eat it, right? In fact, we hunt um, three different kinds of whales. We hunt bowhead, we hunt beluga, and we hunt narwhal. Um, and my daughter, her absolute favorite food in the world is beluga whale. Um, and she was born and raised in Ottawa. We still live in Ottawa. Um, but every, every chance we get, we try and get some country food um, and enjoy that good northern food. Um, it is so healthy for you. It's so delicious. Um, and we don't tend to cook it before we eat it. We like to eat it semi-frozen, frozen. frozen. Um, we like to eat our meat dried or smoked. Um, but yeah, we tend not to cook like seal meat. We eat frozen, dip it in some soy sauce, plop it in your mouth. It is so delicious. It's so good. Um, what a lot of Southerners don't like uh, about country food is that it's so rich up north living in the cold environment. We need that extra iron um, and the extra nutrients so we don't drain the blood from the animal when we harvest it. It's very, very rich meat um, and it's hard for some people to eat. Um, but Inuit, we absolutely love our country food. And down here in Ottawa, any chance we get to have some country food, um, we, we try and jump on it. Now, we don't want too much country food down here um, in Ottawa because we want our families um, and our friends up north to have access to that really um, good, nutritious food instead of always having to go to the grocery store. Now, in our communities up north, um, we do have, like most communities, have one 
grocery store. They may have one restaurant, which is in the one hotel. Um, and depending on the size of your community, there's one or two corner stores. Um, where I come from in Nain, Labrador, there's about 1,200 people who live there. Um, there's a northern store. There's a couple of um, a couple of corner stores. Um, but yeah, there's not many places to pick and choose from. There aren't that many fast food places. In fact, in most Inuit communities, there is no fast food. Um, the fastest food you're going to get is from that one restaurant, which is in the one hotel. Um, and most communities, I mean, they're really, really small, under a thousand people. Um, there are a few bigger ones with like three, four thousand people. Um, but like Greece Fjord only has between 200 and 250 people who live there year round. Um, so life is very different up north. Everybody tends to know everybody else. Um, and another neat thing about up being up north is like you can go for a half hour walk and all of a sudden um, you're by yourself in the tundra. Um, nobody around. It's very quiet up north. Um, I my parents moved me to Ottawa when I was six months old, and I've lived here ever since. I was able to travel to the north twice. Um, and once I got to go to Labrador, and on the way up, we stopped in Happy Valley Goose Bay for a layover. And it was only supposed to be a couple of hours, but it turned into a 12-hour layover. And then I went and spent 12 days um, in three like smaller communities. Um, Hopedale, McCovic, and Nain. And then on the way back down to Ottawa, we had a stopover again in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And uh, I turned to my travel companion and I said, like, what's with all this noise? Like, it's, it's deafening. Um, and it's because the, the airport was doing some renovations um, outside, doing some outdoor construction. And my travel companion, well, she said, well, you didn't notice that this was happening on the way up? I said, no, not at all, right? Because I'm used to being in Ottawa where we hear traffic all the time. Um, and even just spending 12 days up north made a really big difference coming back down to the south. Um, so that's a hard thing for Inuit to deal with when they move from the north to the south for the very first time. They're not used to seeing cars travel so fast um, because up north, without our communities being connected, there's no highways. Most of our roads are dirt roads, so people aren't driving really, really fast, uh, as fast as they do down here. Um, learning how to cross the street when you move from the north down to the south it is a whole different ball game because up north there's no traffic lights you don't have to wait for the little green man to appear you don't have to stop when there's the hand um so learning how to just even cross a street coming down south um is an adventure all on its own um and so yeah but we're People, just like everybody else, we like the same things. We have internet. We have TV. Um, so, I mean, we play video games. We watch the superhero movies. Um, Inuit are just like everybody else. We just want to get along with people. Uh, we just want to have fun. Um, but we still celebrate our, our culture. Right. So like um, everybody notices that I have these two spikes pierced in my lips. Um, I'm waiting on getting my walrus tusks back. So I actually have two two inch walrus tusks that are carved from real walrus tusk. Um, and that's just something that Inuit men did. Um, they wouldn't have the long tusks in the past. They were discs or balls of walrus ivory that were embedded into the lips. Um, if you're walking around, especially here in, in Ottawa, you may, or even Montreal now, you may see some women um, with facial tattoos, lines um, on their forehead or lines on their cheeks, sometimes with dots and lines on their chin. Those are traditional Inuit tattoos. Um, and they were to celebrate different rites of passage. Um, today, they mean different things for different people. 
one of my friends, she has three lines on her chin and they're to represent herself and her two children. Um, we have finger tattoos to pay homage to, to Sedna, our goddess of the sea mammals. Um, forearm tattoos were like uh, your, your family history, your family tree. And the women even used to get their thighs tattooed so that when they gave birth, the first thing that baby saw was beauty. So up north, it was traditionally women who got tattooed. Um, I'm full of tattoos. I have 23 of them now, but none of them are, are traditional because that was a woman's um, thing to do. Um, another traditional thing for women to do is throat singing. Um, and throat singing is actually a game. It was a game that women played while the men were out hunting, while the men were busy, and, and the women were, were left back in the community. They had to find a way to entertain themselves um, and to entertain their babies and their children. So there are three types of throat songs. There's competition, there's imitation, and there's lullaby. So I'm not sure if you've ever seen, but we, uh, Inuit women also carry their babies um, in their mounty in the back of their jacket. Um, and when women throat sing, they sway back and forth um, with the rhythm and the, th the, the throat song, the vibrations, the baby can feel those vibrations through the mom's back. So it helps put the baby to sleep. It helps soothe the baby, reminds them of the time that they were in the womb. And the object of, of throat singing, the way to win, is to make your partner laugh or run out of breath. So Inuit throat singing is the only throat singing done around the world where it is mainly women who do it, and they do it in a pair. And there's a leader and there's a follower. The leader sets the sound, the pace, and the volume of the song and changes them on a regular basis. The follower needs to hear the changes that the leader is making. They need to process the change, and then they need to make the change in a fraction of a second. So throat singing is to Inuit women what, what chess is. It's a way to work your brain, to keep using your brain, and to make that muscle stronger. It's also very entertaining um, because most throat songs end in giggles and in laughter. Um, and, and it's fun to try and trip up your partner. Now, in, in the, the new century, in like the year 2020, there are men who are starting to practice it. Um, there's one fellow, his name is Nelson Taguna, um, and he does throat boxing. So he takes the traditional sounds of throat singing and he mixes them with the new age sounds of, of beatboxing. Um, and he spreads the culture that way. Um, and it's pretty neat. You can also YouTube them uh, when you're done with this live stream. Um, it's pretty neat to see and to hear. Um, so, yeah, um, what else? Oh, yeah. When we hunt um, animals, even today, we try and use every possible part of the body that we can or eat. Um, we have great respect for the animals that we hunt. And when Inuit notice that the numbers are dropping too low, we actually stop hunting that animal. Um, we want to ensure that our grandchildren's grandchildren still have the opportunity to hunt the animals that we eat um, and enjoy so much. Um, so we make sure that we eat every possible part of the body that we can. I mean, we eat seal and fish eyeballs. We eat brains. Um, in the past, when we hunted caribou and they had contents in their stomachs, we could dip our meat in the stomach contents, kind of like a hummus. Um, and then we use their fur, like seal skin here behind me is naturally waterproof. So we can use seal skin to make our mitts and our boots, keeping our hands and our feet dry and warm. Jackets tended to be made from caribou skin. Um, pants were made from like polar bear or caribou. Um, and so we use every part of the body that we can to make things out of. 
Um, and like when you're hunting caribou, for instance, um, to make clothing, you have to know what you're hunting the animal for. So if you wanted, if you needed a new jacket and you wanted to hunt caribou in order to make that new jacket, you had to make sure that you hunted the right caribou. Um, the best caribou to make clothing out of is a yearling because they tend not to shed um, their fur. So you wanted to hunt a, a, a yearling in order to make your jacket out of, and that way your jacket lasted longer. The fur is what helps keep us warm. When we made our jackets out of caribou um, for the winter time, the first layer, the fur would be against our body. Um, trapping all of that body heat inside. And then the second layer, the fur would face outwards, showing the, the beautiful patterns um, of the caribou fur. Um, today, what's really neat is women are like making dresses and purses and hair ties and, and all sorts of accessories um, out of seal skin. And now you can get them dyed um, in a bunch of different colors and they, it looks really nice. Um, and, and yeah, um, what else? I'm trying to think of other things. Inuit played games. We have traditional Inuit games that we play. Um, and on the last session um, in October on the Wednesday, I will be demonstrating some traditional Inuit games that you can play during social times of social distancing. Um, most Inuit games are, are really hard to play during this COVID time because you tend to need a partner and you need to be really, really close with the other person. Um, but there are games that we do like individual strength-based games or stamina-based games um, that I will be demonstrating to everybody um, on the last um, Wednesday of October. So I hope that um, everybody will tune in for that. Uh, so just to recap, Inuit live in the circumpolar region in Canada. We live in Labrador, Northern Quebec, in Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon. In the States, we live in Alaska. In Russia, we live in Siberia. And in Denmark, we live in Greenland. Inuit in Canada do we don't like to be referred to as Eskimos anymore. The word Eskimo is a Northern Cree word that was created to describe us. And in fact, we do eat raw meat because we don't cook it. But that word is a Northern Cree word and it, it was used to describe us originally. But when the settlers came over from Europe, they started to use it to make fun of us, to tease us, to put us down. Um, and so in Canada, we prefer to be referred to as Inuit, um, which is a plural word. So there's no need to put an S end of it. And it means people in English. So you don't have to say the Inuit people. You can just say the Inuit. And me being an individual, I am not Inuit. I am an Inuk, which means person. And again, we have one, two, and many. So one Inuk, two Inuk, and three or more Inuit. Um, it's a pretty cool language. Um, another neat thing about our language is that each individual person of your family has their own moniker. So there's a different word for my father's mother than there is for my mother's mother. That way there's no need to explain the relationship. It's already right there in the word. So every month, or every, sorry, every Wednesday this month from noon to 12.30, um, I'll be teaching a little bit more about the Inuit culture. And like I said, on the last Wednesday this month, I'll be teaching some Inuit games. So uh, come prepared to have some, to, some fun and get some exercise. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their afternoon. Have a great one, guys.